to okay. travel. So hopefully you can see, oh, there you go, excellent. You can see my okay. screen, so yeah. So I'm going to be talking about Hawkshield cohomology of uh, general two-set tensor products. And more specifically, we recently found a way of uh, somewhat elementary computing uh, Lie brackets in Hawkshield cohomology, which is a notoriously difficult task. And this was joint work with Tekin Karadak, Dustin McFate, Tolu Oke, and Sir Wilskun. So yeah, I'm very excited to, to share this with you. So the roadmap for what we're going to do today is I first just introduce and motivate a bit about why would you care about Hawkshield cohomology and why would you care about general twisted tensor products. Then I will properly define what both of, them, of these uh, things are. And then I'll, I'll talk about the results. So what did we do? And these results are not just useless, they're just not theoretical nonsense. They, they actually have some pretty reasonable and pretty decent applications. By reasonable, I mean, I mean computable. And applications mean that they solve some, some problems that weren't, uh, weren't solved just yet. So specifically, we're computing uh, the full Hochschild cohomology, including the Gerson Haber brackets of some Artin Shelter algebras that hadn't been able to be uh, computed till 2019. So, so let's, let's start with, with the introduction. So I'll be keeping this uh, reasonably basic. I, I don't know if there's any graduate students in the audience, but I wanted this to be a pretty general, general talk for a general audience. So we will be uh, having a setup where our main ingredient will be a unital associative algebra over a field, and we'll call that A. And truth be told, we don't really need A to be an algebra over a field, uh, but th this, th this will come into play later. So the Hochschild cohomology, which we will denote for uh, two H's because of Hochschild, and then cohomology. Then this guy, the cohomology that encodes uh, infinitesimal information about our algebra. And well, what, what do I mean by infinitesimal information? Well, let's see what happens uh, in the first uh, lower degree. So the zero Hochschild cohomology turns out to be the center of the algebra, which may not be too infinitesimal, but it's it's a first step. We are we're measuring what commutes and whatnot. Then the first Hochschild cohomology turns out to be the outer derivations of our algebra A. And these are K derivations. So here we do start to see some of this infinitesimal information popping up. And in particular, the way we recover these outer derivations are as a legitimate quotient of all the derivations um, by the inner derivations. And then, even though I will not give you a precise description, the second Hochschild cohomology measures the important. And by measure, I mean these are the important infinitesimal deformations. So these are the deformations that give something not isomorphic to the original algebra. So uh, deformation is just, I'm just changing the multiplication by some bit. I have a multiplication that I obtain 
by having as the main ingredient the original multiplication of my algebra and I perturb it by a tiny bit and then this perturbation may give something that is just the same thing as my original algebra or it may give something different. This uh, second degree uh, measures the, the deformations that give something not isomorphic to the original algebra, which is something that we care about. So, so this is in, in the sense that the Hockey cohomology encodes infinitesimal information. So this, this has some intrinsic interest. And then uh, the twisted tensor product of a couple of algebras. So this was first um, defined by cup. Filch and and Lanzura. And what they did is they proved that whenever an algebra over a field has an underlying vector space, that is given by a tensor product of two subalgebras. Then it is isomorphic to some of these guys. Isomorphic as an algebra. And originally, uh, Cap, uh, Cap, Schilch, and Manzura, they wanted to uh, tackle problems in non-commutative geometry. So they were interested in two tori. Uh, but very quickly, this has uh, proven useful in a wide range of areas. So these guys now have applications in both uh, operator algebras, in algebraic topology, and in quantum symmetries. I am pretty much interested in, in this later one. Uh, but, but what I mean by applications is that this twisted tensor products, even though we will see the definition and it's pretty uncomplicated, these are a massive generalization of cis for algebras, uh, uh, smash products on, of Hopf algebras and other very common constructions. So said, let's, let's start with a definition of the main two players. First one being Hochschild cohomology. So let's jump in straightly with the definition, which is just an X group. So The nth Hochschild cohomology is defined as the nth x group of A with coefficients in A over this AE, which is the enveloping algebra and is defined as A tensor A op, where A op is the opposite algebra. So we, we permute multiplication when we multiply over A op. So again, this, this AE is called the enveloping algebra of A. And it is equivalent to see modules over this enveloping algebra to see by modules over A. They are they're equivalent categories. So if, if we get all the Hochschild cohomologies and we add them up, then we get the, the full Hochschild cohomology. So 
So just add all the X groups. And for me, even though sometimes it's frowned upon, for me, the natural numbers do have zero when, when, it, when it's convenient, like this time. So this is a pretty clean definition. Uh, and in this definition, we are heavily using, even though it's happening uh, behind the scenes, that K is a field. If K is not a field, then we leave the, the setup of the usual homological algebra, and we jump to something that is called relative homological algebra. And all those sequences are slightly different. We need some splittings. We need some, some algebras that come into play. And we will not be talking about that. For me, uh, K will always be a field. But if you're interested in this relative stuff, I'm happy to talk more about it. That is the subject of my thesis. And I am I'm very much interested in what happens when our algebras are not over, over a field. So something desirable is to compute this cohomology as we want with all cohomologies. So it is very useful to just have uh, a resolution that you can always count on. And this resolution that is also useful, not only for historical reasons, this is one of the first ones that was used to define this Hochschild cohomology, but also because there are some uh, multiplication operations that are only defined in it is the bar resolution. So a lot of the, of the theory of Hochschild cohomology relies heavily on the bar resolution. So for this, we consider the tensor of n plus two copies of the algebra as a bimodule over A. So we just multiply on the outermost factors. And we take this for all natural numbers. We put them one after the other, and we get a sequence. this. And in general, this sequence where the, the differentials are just are alternating sums, right? So the differentials are, are what you would expect them to be. I take n elements plus two elements in my algebra. And then I just remove the n plus one tensors that are in between. And whenever I remove a tensor, I just multiply the elements that are left. This is a differential. And this is technically the augmented bar resolution. Uh, but yeah, we don't, we don't really want to take A into account. And this is always a projective resolution. It doesn't matter if our algebra A is or a field or not. Uh, however, when we are working over a field, this turns out to be a free resolution. And in some contexts, this has a legitimate advantage. Uh, but most of the time, we're not really interested in working with just some general resolution that always exists. Usually, we're working with specific families of algebras. And most of the time, these families of algebras have associated resolutions. Uh, and these resolutions are especially convenient uh, to use when we work with them. So for example, if our algebra is a causal algebra, we can use the causal resolution. If it's a complete intersection, we can use a finite free resolution. Or if it's a monomial algebra, and for me, a monomial algebra is basically just a quiver algebra mod by, by some idea generated by, by paths, probably a part two then we just can use the, the so-called Bart cell resolution. And in most of these cases, the computation of the X groups as groups or vector spaces uh, is, can be done much, much faster. Um, however, uh, there are some operations that cannot be defined in them, uh, on them, on those specific tail resolutions. And that is one of the, one of the main caveats of this, this cohomology that the bar resolution allows us to define some operations that are native to, to the resolution 
and we need to do a lot of work usually to transfer these operations onto some special a resolution that we are legitimately interested in working with because of computational advantages. So uh, these two operations are the cup product and the Gerson Haber bracket or the D bracket. So the cup product as the name suggests it's just going from the nth Hochul cohomology across the nth, so you're taking one element of each and lands in their sum, the m plus nth Hochul cohomology, and then the Gerson Haber bracket. What it does is that takes the same input, and maybe with the power of technology, I can just copy and paste. Success, excellent. So, but instead of preserving degree, we lower the degree minus one. So the target is n plus n minus one. We lower the degree by one. And the cup product turns out to be reasonably easy to transfer between these resolutions, but the gerson Haber bracket is not. The gerson Haber bracket is notoriously difficult to compute, and by notoriously I mean very, very difficult. Um, there are specific cases where things have been computed explicitly, but in general, uh, there, is, there is no way to do so. And one of the results that we obtained is precisely our way of doing so. So we, we partially solved some of the issues that that come of computing this cross number bracket over the twisted tensor product of algebras. So, so why would we, why would we care about these two operations? Well, it turns out that the cup product gives the Hochschild cohomology a structure of a graded commutative algebra. Let's see what structures do we obtain. So, as I said, the full Hochschild cohomology with a cup product is a graded commutative algebra. The Gerson Haber bracket it gives the Hochschild cohomology a structure of a graded Lie algebra. And this is an honest and legitimate graded Lie algebra. Um, and it turns out that the cup product and the Gerson Haber bracket are compatible in some specific way. So the cup product is some form of derivation of the Gerson Haber bracket. So the, these operations together give the, the Hochschild cohomology the so called structure of a Gerson Haber algebra. And if you're doing non commutative geometry, maybe you're more familiar with a Poisson 2 algebra or a Poisson algebra with Poisson bracket of degree minus one. And these three names are our quality, they, they mean the same thing. The cup product this Gerson Haber or Lie bracket uh, are compatible. And they, they form a Gerson Haber algebra. So how can we think, just to fix ideas, the Gerson Haber algebra, uh, this can be thought as a graded Lie algebra coming from an associative algebra, essentially. There are some key differences. So if, if we were to be a bit more precise, the degree of the Hochschild cohomology with respect to this uh, Lie bracket, uh, it is one less than the degree of the Hochschild cohomology with respect to the cup product, right? So we have a degree one less when we look at them. And, and this has some issues when we consider these compatibility conditions. So it's a bit more, it's a bit more complicated than just seeing them as uh, the algebra coming from an associative algebra. And this is both what breaks everything apart and what makes everything uh, pretty hard when we do complications, uh, but it's also what makes everything fit into place. And that showcases the utility of, of this Hochschild cohomology. So 
So now that I have, I have told you a bit about this and why, why we care, let's define and spend a bit more time on Twisted Tensor products, which is maybe something that you haven't seen before. So it turns out that twisted tensor products are non-commutative or a way of generalizing uh, in a non-commutative fashion, the usual tensor product. So for this, what we would expect is that when the twist is trivial, we, we, we would want to uh, obtain the, the usual tensor product. And to this effect, uh, the definition begins with two a and B over a field. Here we will not be dealing uh, over um, non-field uh, rings. And we are equipped also with the twisting map. And for us, a twisting map will be a map from B tensor A to A tensor B. That is, Bijective bilinear. And we want this twist to behave nicely with respect to the native operations of the algebras, right? So the, the units and the multiplication. So for this, we, we require our twist to satisfy a few uh, pretty natural conditions. So the first one is that it, it respects units. So we want that if we're twisting by a unit, then what we get is just the same thing. We are safely able to pass units uh, to the other side uh, of elements. This has to be also satisfied for units of A. And the, so th this uh, means that twist is compatible with the units, but we also want the twist to be compatible with the multiplication. So what does that mean? Well, so if, if we want to multiply B and A, we need at least two copies of A and at least two copies of B. And then if we want to apply the twist, then we should be able to like first multiply and then twist or first twist and then multiply. So the natural commutative diagram that we uh, obtain is beginning with four copies of our algebras. We can twist in the middle. Then we can twist twice, both ends. Then we can twist again in the middle. And now we have successfully twisted all the A's past all the B's. And then we can multiply. Alternatively, we can first multiply. And then twist. And the competitive compatibility conditions require that this commutes. So let me emphasize this because this will play a key role in the minutes to come. We are multiplying on one side and then we're twisting on the other. And these two guys commute.
So we're not really asking for anything fancy. We're just asking that the natural operations and the natural structure of our both, our algebras, are preserved. So it turns out that this is, uh, this is enough to get an algebra. So we can redefine multiplication in such a way that we get an algebra. So the twisted tensor algebra, which we denote by the usual tensor product, but with this sub tau, this is just a tensor V as a vector space with multiplication given the first twisting and then multiplying. So first we twist in the only way that we can twist, and then we multiply in the only way that we can multiply. And it turns out that with this definition, the multiplication will turn out to be associative, which is maybe surprising given that our algebras we're just any algebras. So the, if my title is not too misleading, then what we want to do is we want to understand the Hochschild cohomology uh, of this algebra. And as I've mentioned, since this family of algebra vastly generalizes some uh, predominant constructions all throughout uh, mathematics, then we're actually computing uh, a pretty general uh, cohomology. So uh, of course, we, we can do the, like, the naive way of just treat this algebra as a given algebra, but that's, that's not the smart way. That's not a reasonable way of doing it. So the idea here is to use some previously known information from A and B, and then somehow bootstrap that together, or maybe not bootstrap, but like get something super clean, depending on, on how smart we are. And, and then use this information that we have put together uh, to, to understand this, this cohomology. And the type of information that I'm talking about uh, may be something like using one of the tail resolution for specific families of algebras that we mentioned, right? So maybe A and B are Casul, Maybe it turns out that this twisted tensor product is also causal, and maybe we can find uh, causal resolutions by tensoring causal, resol causal resolutions. Or maybe we are dealing with Bart cell resolution and something similar uh, comes up. Uh, in our specific case, the, since we are interested in computing the Gussel-Haber bracket, what we are interested is in, well, knowing the Gussel-Haber brackets of the Hochschild cohomologies of A and B separately, then we would like to put that together to uh, find the Gerson Haber bracket of the full uh, Hochschild cohomology of the twisted tensor product. So in this spirit, what we would like to do is we will uh, want to reconstruct modules and reconstruct resolutions for this twisted tensor product given modules and resolutions for A and B. We're not looking for specific properties just yet. And Before we're done, may I ask you a question? Please. Is there a spectral sequence that relates the Hochschild homologies of A and B separately to the Hochschild homology of the, of the twisted tensor product? Uh, not to my knowledge, um, but that is a very good question. I do not know, or at least not to my knowledge. Yeah. Um, okay, so. So yeah, like part of the complexity of this is that tracking what like this twist can be very complicated. It can be trivial, but it can also be extremely complex. And this means that tracking what the twist does on general solutions is very complicated. And those are some of the complications that we tackled in, in our paper. We, we were able to decipher 
how the twist behaves when we apply it uh, throughout our solution. So, although that is something that I wasn't necessarily going to mention, so thank you for the question. Uh, all, all of that is, is a bit hidden under the, the results. So, there are some, some niceness conditions in the same way that we asked that there are some niceness conditions of the twisting map with respect to, to the algebras, we can, we can also require um, niceness conditions of the twisting map with respect to A and B by module, right? Again, if our spirit is to reconstruct resolutions, then maybe we should ask for compatibility of modules since we're already asking for compatibility over the algebras. And, and there is indeed a reasonable notion uh, of that, right? So we can, we can ask for two bimodules. We can ask that the module actions are compatible with tau. With, with the twist. So, um, if we, if we allow ourselves to have some extra compatibility conditions, then we can give the tensor product of modules a natural structure of my module over the twisted tensor product algebra. And again, compatibility has just to do with the twist preserving the reasonable uh, module action and the twist and the multiplication commuting and all multiplications right like the modulation commuting with the the twist and also commuting with the multiplication of b and a and similarly we can ask for compatibility conditions of resolutions so there's a similar notion of compatibility of projective resolutions. So that is, in, in some sense, we can sometimes have that our resolutions are good enough that maybe we can twist them past each other. And these are some of the complications that are happening behind the scenes, right? So if we want to to compute resolutions of our twisted tensor product, we can we cannot usually expect to just be able to do the same tensoring with the twist over by modules. And what we actually need is some like higher structures that actually give us uh, that. Um, so, uh, sorry, can I ask a real quick question? Um, what? Uh, what are M and N being tensored over? Is that over A tensor B? No, this is over the field. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah. So, thank you for the question. Yeah, all my tensors, if they are not decorated with anything, are always over the field. Um, okay, so it turns out that if all of these conditions are satisfied, then uh, we can we can legitimately tensor the resolutions. And this is a theorem by Kepler and Witherspoon. So under these compatibility conditions, We're given good enough resolutions of A and B. And by good enough, I mean projective by module resolutions that are compatible with the twisting map. Then we can construct a 
the twisted tensor product of the resolutions. And this guy turns out to be a nice resolution projected by modular resolution of the twisted tensor product. So um, this guy over here turns out to be almost uh, exactly a, a total complex with like maybe some some switch on the on the differential, some signs or some some twists being composed, but essentially a total complex. Okay, so we, we've done quite a bit of like theory so far. So what are examples of of these guys? Like what resolutions are good enough? Well, uh, expectedly so, uh, the bar resolution is good enough. So. We have two algebras with respective bar solutions. Then, for any twist, they are compatible. Well, this is this is pretty good. This is maybe not surprising, but this is legitimately good. After all, the only thing that quote unquote only thing that tau is doing is just moving a past b. So if we have a bunch of copies of a and we want to pass them to the other side of a bunch of copies of a, maybe applying tau a few times works, and it does work. It is technically difficult to prove, but it is after all just technique, and. Then another, uh, maybe also surprising uh, thing that happens is the coastal resolutions, uh, when when uh, the twist is strongly graded, then these are also compatible. So in, in this case, A and B should be causal algebras of A and B. So these guys are compatible with strongly created. Twisting maps. And so graded maps, what they do is they preserve grading. Strongly graded, they preserve a bit more, right? So instead of just sending something of uh, a certain degree to something of that same degree, we're actually requiring uh, a tiny bit more of, of the map. But we have two pretty reasonable and big families of example of examples to to play with. So what what did we actually do? Let me let me jump to to our results. So we extended work of let me let me give the names. Chris Negra and Witherspoon, as well as Grimley and Guyan Witherspoon. And even though we didn't explicitly use them, uh, this also implicitly uses work of Volkov. Um, so what we did is we, we proved that if we are given um, resolutions that are nice enough, then we can legit we can actually compute what we wanted. So we we'll give resolutions of A and B. And we want them to be usually projected by model resolutions. And then we require that this total complex that is obtained when twisting Uh, 
that this guy is is nice. And by nice, I mean a co-unital differential graded co-algebra. So we have a co-unit and we also have a diagonal map, uh, a co-chain diagonal map and a co-chain uh, co-unit. So there's like a, quite a bit of technical work um, under uh, this nice uh, statement. So given this, this nice co-algebra, then there is, oh, and there is, another nice isomorphism between uh, two total total complexes. So we, we get our solutions and we twist them. So P and Q are solutions. And then we take the total complex with respect to the twisted tensor product. Then we also twist P past Q again. So we're doing two total complexes here and here. And then we're doing another total complex in the middle. So this will be uh, a, chain map, a chain map isomorphism with the next three So again, we have here, here, and here, we have three uh, total complexes. So if this is a chain map isomorphism and it satisfies that it lifts a natural multiplication that we have in degree one, um, then if these two niceness conditions are satisfied, then we can give an explicit formula for the Gusenhofer bracket. emphasis on the explicit and also formula. So given all this information, we are just able to cook up using uh, or extending some of the results that I mentioned of Negron, Witherspoon, Grimm, Negron, Witherspoon, and partially Volkov. I'm just able to cook up something that is an explicit formula for this uh, Hochschild cohomology, uh, for the Gershom bracket on this Hochschild cohomology. Um, but this, this by itself may not be exceedingly useful. And we also proved that the bar solution always satisfies the hypothesis of this theorem, right? So the example that we have up here says that the bar solution is compatible, okay? But it doesn't tell us anything about the existence of the sigma. And it doesn't tell us anything about whether this is a co-unital DG co-algebra. We prove that those guys are. And we also prove that when we have strongly graded taus, the hypothesis of this theorem are also satisfied. So in fact, our theorem uh, satisfies essentially all known examples of, of compatibility between resolutions. So, so this is, this is something very exciting because now this allows us to explicitly compute examples that hopefully weren't able to be computed before with this with these new techniques. And one thing that that is necessary to to say is that since the Boris solution always exists, uh, even though it may be complicated, these formulas are applied uh, are applicable in full generality, right? So the Boris solution always satisfies the hypothesis of this theorem. So I always always can find a formula for the Kirsten-Hubbard bracket that I want if I just follow um, the formula that, that we give you for, for the, the bar solution. This may be cumbersome, but it is doable. And a computer can certainly do it. So, so this, is, this is completely general, which is very exciting. And, and the, the last part that we did is that even though I have mentioned that the hypothesis of, the, of this theorem are, sati are satisfied for strongly graded tau's. 
It turns out that they are also satisfied when the twisting map is not well behaved. Maybe not always, but there are examples where this theorem is also, the hypotheses are also satisfied, even though the resolutions may not be compatible. So we applied this. To the Jordan plane. So we computed using this theorem and we provide we computed an explicit description of the curse number algebra structure. the Hochschild cohomology of the Jordan plane, which is the free algebra, two variables mod by this ideal. So why, why would this be relevant? Why would this be something desirable? Well, it turns out that uh, we can see the, the Jordan plane as a twisted tensor product. That's the that's the whole point of, of applying our theorem. We can actually see that this quotient is isomorphic to just two copies of polynomial rings where tau sends y tensor x to x tensor y plus term of degree two. So here is where the twist is not strongly graded. So this twist has degree one in X, degree one in Y, landing in degree one in X, degree one in Y, but then degree two in X. So because of this term, this is not a strongly graded twist. However, we were able to manually find uh, the isomorphism sigma that we required and to manu manually prove that this co-algebra is DG co-unital and then the theorem applied. And then we were able to use the theorem to, to explicitly describe the person haber uh, algebra structure on this Hochschild cohomology. And this was uh, something that had been done just uh, a couple of months before us by uh, Lopez and Solotar. And they use some very heavy machinery that without getting into too many details, they did use uh, spectral sequences and they use uh, a version of annex resolution. And they also use methods specific for derivations. So they required invoking uh, previous methods that were only applicable for derivations of degree one. Um, so, so we did not do um, any of that, we just uh, used fairly elementary techniques to, to compute this. And it turns out that according to the Artin Shelter classification, uh, the Jordan plane is only one of three types of algebras of global dimension two. And there are, uh, there is an ongoing classification of uh, twisted tensor products of planes without any restriction on the twisted map. And there, there are some computations in this specific example that seem to be useful and transferable to, to twisted uh, tensor products of planes in general without any restriction on this twisting map. And that is ongoing work in progress that I am I'm very excited to, to do. And it's, it, it's fascinating to see how, how this is being developed. And, and this being said, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? Hello. So I, I have one question then. Please. 
so I think that is it the the twisted tensor product algebra is like a, a more general version of tensor product of algebra in let's say some braided uh, tensor category defined by a Hopf algebra or something like that or group. I think so. Yeah. So um... it's a more general uh, setting, right? It just doesn't have to be these algebra doesn't have any. Uh, doesn't have to sit inside certain braided uh, tensor category. They they do not. They do not. So that means that, but your result could apply to this setting, right? Uh, excuse me. Your result can apply to algebra in this setting, I guess. Yes, as long as yeah. So there, there's nothing specific about our algebras or yeah, where they live. Good enough. Yeah, at least I know that. Um, it it may be harder to find resolutions in general categories. That's definitely uh, yeah. an obstruction. It's another another problem. Right? <laughs> you, you always have this power solution, I guess. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, okay. So, so you oh, mentioned that the Jordan plane is art and shelter regular. Is there a reason why you would expect these to be like nicer or easier to compute for art and shelter regular algebras? Mm. So in this specific case of art and shelter regular algebras where the global, global dimension is controlled, then many times we can find a decomposition like this, where we have just the a twisted tensor product of some copies of polynomial rings. Uh, a surprisingly amount of times. And in this specific case, everything is causal, right? Like both polynomial rings are causal. So everything depends on whether the twist behaves well or not. And we just proved, we just proved that we don't actually require the twist to be very well behaved for our methods to be applicable. We can just manually impose, oh, let me just prove that there is actually such an isomorphism. Let me just prove that there is actually such a coyundal DG co-algebra structure. And so this hints as, well, maybe this is useful for uh, classification theorems because we can uh, see what, uh, what, what are the restrictions on the twisting maps in these uh, RD shelter uh, regular algebras. And then we can see, oh, for this twist map, it seems to be reasonable to expect that the Hochschild homology can be computed or not. And over coastal resolutions, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it is somewhat predictable what the twist is going to do. And that is definitely helpful. That is hands down very helpful. Just one question. Does this whole theory become trivial if you do cyclic homology? It's a really good question that I, I do not know, but I think so. You think it becomes as trivial? Uh, I think it, I think it just reduces to the cyclic homology of A tensor B, but do not quote me on that. Okay. Uh, one last question. When you say Gersten Haber algebra, is there an operad for this? Yes. No. Okay. So these are operatic algebras. Yes, uh, I am seeing all of them from like a very algebraic perspective, uh, but uh, the Hochschild cohomology has a very uh, intuitive operatic description, very much so. Okay. Um, so uh, there is a paper by, I'm not going to remember both authors, which is a shame. Um, And uh, Coboton and uh, Liburnet, if I'm not too mistaken. And um, rooted tree operands. And something, something, something. And here they explain, they explain a bit on how, how Hochschild cohomology has a very natural operatic interpretation. And they go much, much more than that. They go 
in almost full generality. But yeah, absolutely, there is a, yeah, there is like an operatic interpretation of all of this. I have one question. Please. So when you look at art and shelter algebras in dimension three and possibly four, they're classified, but pretty much nothing is known in higher dimensions. Is it? Is there something you can say about classification of art and shelter algebras in higher dimension from point of view of their Hochschild cohomology? In general, I am not aware of them, uh, but it is work in progress to see what happens for uh, twisted tensor planes. So if if I have this this very specific setup where I'm just changing the tau, mm -hmm. so for this specific family, then yes, we're working on it. Mm -hmm. But a priori, there are a million art in shelter algebras that are not falling in these lines. Like very true. nobody knows what are they in dimension five. They could be some extremely large object that in general doesn't Absolutely. look like doesn't look like Sklanian algebras or elliptic algebras. They could be a lot more general than that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this this doesn't uh, this is not expected to uh, be bumped up to any general classification. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if there are no further questions or comments, let's thanks this uh, Pablo again. Thank you. Thank you.